Hello and welcome to Pythian's Expert Insights, a series dedicated to providing expert knowledge on the bleeding edge of technology. Today we are joined by one of Pythian's Oracle Database Principal Consultants, Simon Pym, to discuss Oracle Net Service name resolutions, getting rid of the TNS names .ora file. Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation on Oracle Net Services and getting rid of the TNS names .ora file. There are better solutions. My name is Simon. I'm a Oracle Principal Consultant uh, here at Pythian. I've been working in the Oracle space for almost my whole career, which is almost about 20 years. So really I started at uh, Oracle version 6 and I've worked right the way up to version 12C. Obviously, along the way, I have um, lots of Oracle credentials, as you see here, and I speak quite regularly, and hence I'm an Oracle Ace associate currently. Anyway, let's dive into today's presentation. This presentation is targeted really for the Oracle DBAs. Now, uh, people worry, um, they see words like LDAP on the screen, and I've had DBAs ask me, what is LDAP? Um, that's okay. Today's presentation is designed to give you some background about these things and explain what some of these terms and definitions mean. So it's really intended for Oracle DBAs. This is not a presentation that's aimed at system administrators or network administrators specifically. All right. So first of all, in order to make the conversation go smoothly, I like to give a little refresher of some of the terms and technologies. So what are we talking about here? Well, first of all, a net service name in the Oracle context, context is really what we type behind the username and password in a connection string. Okay, so we might say connect Scott slash Tiger at ORCL. ORCL is really called the net service name. Sure, we may call it by other names just casually or for lack of proper definition, but really that's what we, the proper definition is. Now, what that translates to, as most Oracle DBA should know, is what's called a full connect descriptor. So that's where we have description equals, address equals, and all the stuff that follows that, that all Oracle DBA should be quite familiar with. And of course, it almost goes without saying, most of the time we find those in the TNS names.ora file. Again, every DBA knows that and probably knows it quite well. And that's really what the purpose of today's presentation is, as was mentioned in the title, or what are the alternatives to the tnsnames.org file. Okay, going back to the very basics. Well, first of all, we can put all of that connect descriptor information right in at the command prompt, and we have been able to for, for quite a while. So in these two examples here, you can see first I do a TNS ping from a Unix, or actually a Linux command prompt, and I can put the full connect descriptor in there. So I'm not relying on a TNS names uh, entry or net service name at all. Similarly, in the second example, you can see I'm doing the exact same thing, but I'm pro providing the credentials as well and actually connecting to the database to make sure I'm going that step further, whereas a TNS ping only communicates with the listener, make sure that the listener is responsive. Here I'm going end to end and making sure I can connect to the database. Right? So that's pretty simple to do, but people often overlook that functionality or forget or maybe don't know that you actually don't need any resolution at all. You can provide everything at the command line um, as an argument if you like. Now, that's typically not done because it's long and cumbersome to write in or implement, but it is sometimes good for testing and troubleshooting. In Oracle 10G, they added the new Easy Connect functionality, which really shortened what we saw in the above, this previous screens, allowing us to just specify the host port, if not 1521 by default, and the service name. And again, you can see we can easily use the Easy Connect um, syntax as long as we've specified Easy Connect in our SQL Net.ora file, and it works for both a TNS ping and an actual database connection. One thing that uh, DBAs often overlook is really how many different places there may be uh, for the TNS names .ora file, right? Um, people think of the obvious location, which is the dollar Oracle home slash network admin, but often uh, overlook some of the other ones. Now, you can see on the screenshot here, I'm doing an S trace um, of a Linux TNS ping command. I just put in XYZ as the host or the, the descriptor that I'm trying to 
ping just as a dummy entry, just to see how many different places it looked. So there's a couple surprising ones in there. Like there's things that you would would expect to see, like you first touch the SQLnet.ora that's in Oracle Home Network Admin. But then there's some other ones that are maybe a little bit more obscure and that DBAs may not even know about. Like for example, a hidden tnsnames.ora file starting with a period that's in the home directory of the Oracle user or one in the etc directory. Anyway. The command that I've shown there is a good utility or a good command that DBAs can run to really understand on their system and given their environment and their environment variables where Oracle will actually search for a TNS names or a file when it's trying to re do resolution. Okay, and and it's maybe going to be a little bit surprising to them as to how many places it does actually search. The important thing to understand though is to put in a dummy entry like I did here with the XYZ because that way it'll, you'll force it to list out for you all the different places they could possibly search. Where, as I've written here, in reality it stops once it finds the first match. Now, why do I not like the tnsnames.ora file? Well, first of all, it's unstructured data, and DBAs are all about structured data. DBAs and the concept of databases is that we don't have tons and tons of unstructured flat files or Excel spreadsheets to run a business. Instead, we put it in a structured repository called the database. So why do DBAs then have this unstructured TNS names to raw file? And I've seen variety of sizes of TNS names to raw files. The largest I've seen have a roughly 1,400 or um, well over 1,000 approaching a thousand and a half entries. So we have this huge unstructured file and that presents uh, some risk. We, we don't do the same thing with DNS. DNS is, we could argue, is conceptually similar, okay? Except at the server level where we're, we are resolving a server host name. However, we never have huge host files on a desktop Windows desktop, for example, or on a database server, a Unix or Linux database server. No, instead we always point to a DNS server that acts as a common centralized repository for DNS entries and provides a resolution to us. And the final thing is that since this is a free flow file, the TNS names.ora, there's lots of opportunity to make it inconsistent between entries. It may be inconsistent in structure, or in syntax and actual layout. So it becomes a very difficult file to work with. In my experience, I've seen many, many different techniques of how DBAs and administrators, system administrators maybe, manage having the TNS file um, or, or manage it throughout their environment. Uh, of course, I've seen jobs, nightly batch jobs sometimes that push out the latest and greatest copy of that file to every server and desktop in the environment. I've seen centralization by using the TNS admin environment variable or soft links where they place it on a common network share, maybe an NFS share, maybe it's a Windows share drive, whatever. And I've also seen a lot of linking of the files that maybe, uh, you know, the entry that's pushed out, or sorry, the file that's pushed out to everybody's desktop doesn't have all the entries, but rather uses the I file to create up to four soft links to other TNS files, which may be in more centralized or common locations. So over my years, I've seen a variety of techniques for managing the TNS names.ora file. Um, however, all of them have their challenges. So what are some of the challenges? Well, I've already touched on some of this. First of all, I think the most important issue or challenge with maintaining a large TNS names Aurora file is that you run the risk that if you have one bracket in the wrong place, you can corrupt the file. And you really corrupt it from that point onwards because it searches the file sequentially. So if you have 1,400 entries and you corrupt the third entry but with an extra bracket, you potentially uh, have made it impossible for Oracle to read all the subsequent 1400 minus 3 entries. It's also difficult and cumbersome to work with and there's always some challenges when you go to the management techniques that were presented in the previous slide. If it's centralized and you introduce a problem such as a, a bad bracket or misaligned bracket or unmatched bracket, you potentially can affect every user in your organization. 
if it's a one centralized location. If it's localized, meaning it's copied to every desktop, well then there's time that's required to propagate changes. For example, I mentioned previously, there might be a batch job that runs uh, nightly that pushes out changes. So potentially you made a change to a service name, for example, uh, a host name or changed or a new database is added requiring a new entry and it takes um, overnight or potentially even longer for the new copy to be pushed out. And finally, you run the risk that you're going to have all these different copies in your environment. Uh, people might manually change them and hence have their changes clobbered when new ver master copies are pushed out. Um, and, and you run this risk of things getting out of sync and they're being mismatched. So overall, there's, there's a lot of different problems with this approach of trying to maintain a tnsnames.org file. Now, that all being said, I do find that almost all organizations or a, a very, very high percentage of organizations still do use the tnsnames.org file. It's only a small percentage that has adopted some other technique. And when I ask people, why are you still doing it this way, the answer almost every time is, that's the way we've always been doing it. And we try to mitigate the risks the best we can. We try to make sure that we don't have unmatched brackets or, or we just know that it takes a day for changes to propagate and that's just the way it is. But my argument and the point of this presentation is to challenge that thought, to say just because we did it that way in the past doesn't mean that's the best way or the way that we should be implementing it on a go forward basis. So the whole purpose of this presentation really is to stimulate thought and to challenge the old ways of doing things and to present some different ideas of what might be a better or more efficient way. Okay, so what are our options and how can we make things better? Well, there are a number of different options that I'm going to discuss in the next few minutes, but they're all based around this concept of an LDAP compatible directory server. So what three am I going to really talk about? Well, Three, the three main ones are Oracle Internet Directory, otherwise known as OID, Microsoft Active Directory, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with or at least have, has heard of that name or AD. I think that even organizations where the majority of user desktops are Macintosh based, um, that are highly Apple friendly environments, I, I still believe that even those Apple Mac desktop environments truly do have an Active Directory infrastructure buried down lower within their organization because likely they have a number of servers that run Windows at the very minimum. So I, I, I mean, of course there's going to be exceptions, but I rarely have seen an organization that doesn't have Microsoft Active Directory as one of their core fundamental technologies somewhere in the environment. A third one which I'm also going to discuss and that I've had uh, some hands-on experience with is a free open source product called Open LDAP. And others that I'm not going to touch on today but certainly could be used in the same capacity um, as the concepts that we're going to review here um, are numerous. Uh, Apache Directory Server and Red Hat Directory Server are maybe some of the more common ones, but also some platform specific ones like IBM Tivoli Directory Server and Sun's Java System Directory Server are alternatives that could be used. So the purpose of this presentation is to stimulate the thought and give some background on how you can store these TNS entries for lack of better term and I did define the de proper definitions at the beginning of the presentation but TNS entry in, in, in reality is the name that most DBAs use to refer to a service name net descriptor. Um, well putting it in an LDAP compatible directory store is the best way um, and will be discussed further. Other alternatives you know is to not have one at all and just rely on Easy Connect where you're providing all of the routing and connection information at the in the connection string as was shown earlier or maybe using a hybrid of all the different approaches. All right, well it's important first of all to understand how the data is stored in a directory server and Oracle has actually published what they call the LDAP schema for Oracle Net Services and within that are structural LDAP classes for Oracle Net. Now for a DBA uh, or somebody who's database focused, that kind of sounds confusing. It may not uh, make a lot of sense, but really all we need to understand is that 
the LDAP directory server is effectively a, a very use specific and customized database. So it's just like the Oracle databases that we're used to working with and deploying. And similarly, they've published a schema, just like uh, an application might publish a schema for accounting in an Oracle database or whatever, whatever other purpose. Um, Oracle has provided this LDAP class that's specific to Oracle Net. So really think of it almost as if as tables and columns within an Oracle database. It's just, it's not an Oracle database. It's an LDAP directory server instead. And these entries are all specific to Oracle Net routing and resolution. Okay, so what decision criteria do we need to consider when choosing which one of the alternatives? I um, can't say that I'm going to give a recommendation that says use this one over top of all of the others. I think that's uh, something that needs to be evaluated on an organization by organization basis because every organization might have different requirements. I've tried, however, to list a number of good questions that you should be asking yourself if considering this approach. Okay, and there's important things like the first few points about supported platforms and whether I need software, hardware, and licenses and stuff like that. But there's also operational considerations that are really important that are kind of in the middle there. Like, can I bulk load all of my existing entries? If you have 1,400 entries like I was mentioning, you sure don't want to have to have a DBA manually entering those into a new system we bulk loading is going to be mandatory under almost all circumstances. Is it easy and scriptable to add additions? Can we automate that process or similarly modifications and removals? And there's going to be exceptions where we're going to need um, tnsnames.org files still generated for those very few applications that are not going to be compatible. So do we have the technology to easily export our entries into uh, tnsnames.org format. Lastly, you know, there's some other non-functional criteria that you might want to consider, such as can we put advanced entries like TAF or RAC entries, can we use aliases, and what high availability and security mechanisms are available. So that's a really good list that should be able to help you evaluate um, what might be the best fit having a keyboard issue here, sorry about that. All right, seem to be back on track here. OID, Oracle Internet Directory. Well, that's our first and usually that's the most obvious option. So what are some of the benefits from that? Well, first of all, that's an Oracle product. We're using this for Oracle routing and hence we're suggesting an Oracle product. Of course, that's gonna have full support from Oracle. Secondly, the actual data is stored in an Oracle database, and that's something that Oracle DBAs already know how to manage and back up. So it's something that's uh, a little less obscure and a little bit more understandable for DBAs. And of course, part of that management is knowing high, high availability options, whether they want to replicate that with Oracle Data Guard or whatnot. And it's got built-in um, options that make it very easy to export to a tnsnames.org file using the, the GUI. And finally, it's also very easy to handle multiple contexts. Now, hopefully you don't have multiple contexts in your environment. I really don't like to see environments that have, uh, for example, their domain.com as well as no suffix as well as the dot world and really have a mixture of all three of those because I think it makes uh, things confusing and adds complexity. But if you do have multiple contexts, um, OID I find is very easy to, to work with for handling those. However, some of the downside to OID is if you want to use the full functionality of it and the full, realm, full spectrum of interfaces, it uses web logic as a front end. And most Oracle core DBAs like myself may not be as familiar with WebLogic Server as they are with the core database. And that potentially adds some difficulty to your environment. It means now that we have another layer of software that's going to require patching. That's both the WebLogic Server and this new database instance that we've potentially spun up just to hold all of this uh, 
TNS names or net service descriptor information. And in my experience, whenever somebody is implementing OID in the environment, it's usually a project and part of that project is provisioning of new hardware and new software dedicated for this purpose. So all in all, is it a good solution? Uh, yes, it, it functionally will work very well, but it seems to me like there's an awful lot of hardware and software that may be cumbersome to work with if it's just for this purpose. If you're using OID for other purposes, well then maybe um, you're just adding on functionality to it and that makes more sense, but if you're just using it for net service name lookup, it may be a lot of overkill. The second option is Active Directory. Again, I don't know of any organizations that don't already have Active Directory somewhere in their or somewhere within that organization. Um, and there's some really great benefits. Not only is it already there, but now the DBA is no longer responsible for high availability, for patching it, for updating it. Similarly, as we already know, since Active Directory and, D and other similar services such as DNS are usually so critical to an infrastructure, there's already replication and high availability options. It's already a critical part of the network infrastructure. So it's actually quite surprising um, how easy it is to set up and move all of your um, Oracle Net entries into Active Directory, but there are some downsides. The downsides, however, I find are more process and political than they are technological, right? Technically, it's pretty easy to do, and Oracle provides a really great step-by-step -step, um, guide for doing so, and I have a virtual demo with some screenshots that I will show at the end of this presentation. But the downside really is that in order to do this, the Oracle DBA and will require administrative access to the domain controllers. And my experience is whenever um, Windows-based system administrators hear that, oh, the Oracle guys want administrative access to this critical part of their infrastructure that's so sensitive, it's usually a political issue and they say, no, we don't want to let these guys touch this thing. Okay, so that's really probably the number one downside. The next issue is that extra AD permissions may be required to make queries, right? You may have to allow uh, anonymous queries if coming from Unix platforms where the client can't automatically authenticate against Active Directory and uh, things like that. Again, these are things that are more um, process oriented where Active Directory or Windows domain system administrators are likely to say, ah, we don't really want to give that to the Oracle guys, or why are we extending our Active Directory for this unknown Oracle product, which they typically know very little about, consider it a black box, and maybe um, quite possibly doesn't Oracle doesn't have the best reputation within the organization for whatever reasons. So a third option is Open LDAP, and I've deployed um, not by my choosing, but uh, but I would also still recommend this, open LDAP at a number of different sites. Now, there's a few um, real strategic advantages of open LDAP. First of all, it's a free open source software product that runs on a variety of operating systems. I've worked in environments where we've deployed it on Linux and Solaris, and including hybrid environments where it's partially on Linux and partially on Solaris with replication between the two, and it's been very successful. It gives us a lot of functional options, such as master-slave replication. Um, we can have multiple slaves, and that, as I mentioned in my previous example, can even cross the platform and Indian boundaries, uh, such was the case when I was going from Linux to Solaris and eventually reversing direction of which was the master and which was the slave. Um, really, as the client did a replatforming um, from one hardware and the software infrastructure to another, and one of the things that needed to migrate was Open LDAP, which was used for Oracle Net service name resolution. And of course, it's easy to update. Um, for example, if it's just a yum command within Linux deployments. Now, to install it on Linux is very simple. It's just an RPM uh, that gets installed. And 
What runs in the background is what's called the standalone LDAP directory server, or SLAPD, as I sometimes say, whether correctly or incorrectly. Now, the nice thing about this is that uh, it's really quite lightweight and simple. So if you have a highly available um, Unix-based server that's already provisioned and running some other background services, it's quite easy to add uh, open LDAP and the standalone LDAP directory server on top of that environment. Now, you do need some root permissions to install because obviously we're installing new software and it requires some basic Linux skills, which most DBAs already, of course, have. Now, one of the biggest downsides of OpenLDAP is that it doesn't come with a GUI. And for a new technology that DBAs don't really know the commands for um, and haven't really worked with a lot, that can be a bit of a challenge. Fortunately, however, I've had a lot of success with Apache Directory Studio. The biggest problem with Apache Directory Studio is is quite a fairly large file to download, as in a couple hundred megabytes, and you'd think it'd be something lighter and simpler. But really, that's about it. You download a couple hundred megabytes of a free um, product here, Apache Directory Studio, and you set it up, and you just connect to your OpenLDAP sources, and it gives you a graphical interface as you can see in the screenshot example. So on the right in the screenshot example, you can start to see that we got some LDAP kind of uh, nomenclature as in CN or canonical name. And here I've got a PeopleSoft example, so I call it PSoft. And you can see at the bottom right, the Oracle Net description string. And there is the familiar description equals, address equals, protocol equals that DBA should be very familiar with already. Okay, there's other alternatives too. There's web-based interfaces and things like that. So it does not come with a GUI um, included. However, there are a number of no-cost alternatives that are available. Now, it's important to really understand that all three of these things are really just different versions of the same thing. Okay, Active Directory sure sounds like it's a different product than Open LDAP or OID, but really at the heart of them, they are LDAP compliant applications. Uh, Active Directory feels like a black box to almost everybody in an organization, technologists included, unless they are Windows system administrators. And it kind of usually comes as a surprise to most people to understand that really it's still LDAP compatible and compliant. Hence, we can use common LDAP utilities and commands to complete some of the functionality that's necessary if we're going to implement something like this. For example, LDAP add and LDAP search are two very common commands for adding new entries or for extracting existing entries. The example here I'm showing uh, in the screenshot is where I am using LDAP search as a tool to search my directory store, in this case it's open LDAP, and to build myself a TNS names Aurora file. So LDAP search extracts all of the command, um, sorry, all of the entries that are related to Oracle Net, and then I'm really just using some grep and sed commands to reformat some syntax, remove things like CN or canonical name equals, and to format it into Oracle TNS name .org file compatible syntax. But really, that's it. You see, this is a one-time effort where I can write a little script that's only four lines long and I can extract from my directory store and create a TNS names Aurora file. Now, as mentioned earlier, OID already has a button that can do this for you. However, if you're not using OID, if you're using um, Active Directory or using OpenLDAP, then maybe you need to make a script. And the exact syntax of the grep and set commands are gonna vary ever so slightly depending on the LDAP directory service that, you have, that has been chosen. Now, the best part about this is where are all these tools? They're already installed into every Oracle software installation that you have. So whether it's a database home or it's a client home, go and try the commands as I've shown here. List what's in the Oracle home bin LDAP directory, and you'll see that all of these tools and utilities are already present. Again, most DBAs don't know that they already have the commands and utilities, rather, that they need. Now, this is set up with, the, or this is included with the Oracle software for purpose of OID, but again, these are generic utilities that can be used against any directory store. 
So there's no need to install separate software or download or try and have your system administrator add these tools to your Unix or Linux box. If, you, if you're an Oracle DBA, you'll already have Oracle software installed there and hence those tools are there. So what's the downside to all this? Well, with OID, as was mentioned, the entire software stack is supported, right? So if there are any issues, you're going to be able to open an Oracle SR and get Oracle to help you investigate them. It may be surprising, again, to Oracle DBAs to know that Active Directory is also fully supported. So, again, Oracle is going to help you, and you're perfectly uh, within your rights to open an Oracle SR if you if you have a problem that you can't overcome and you need to. However, if you choose one of the other vendors, you're not going to be able to necessarily open an Oracle SR if they think that the problem is due to the directory store, namely Open LDAP or one of those other LDAP servers that were listed earlier. However, I challenge everybody to think, is that really an issue? Well, probably not is what I think. I think if the most common issue that you're going to encounter is the common 3505 fail to resolve name error. This is one that DBAs are already familiar with and already have good terrible shooting techniques. However, I'll go into some more detail on what things we can do if we do experience those that specific error. Other risks or concerns are, are we going to have performance um, delays resolving the entry? So that's quite possible and searching in Oracle there's a number of my Oracle support notes already published primarily for older versions of the software and uh, in very specific um, use cases where there's been a performance issue getting the results back from the LDAP compatible directory server mostly OID. So if you are considering this and you are doing a proof of concept Definitely measuring performance, making sure you're getting quick, speedy response times from your directory server is of paramount importance. But it's important to remember that this is an initial lookup only, right? When you try to establish a connection, you're doing a quick data dip onto the directory server, getting the information that you need, and it's sending it back to the client, and the client's then creating a new socket for the listener. It's not used again anywhere else in the connection process. So um, the connection is persistent from that point onwards and isn't using it uh, on, a, on a consistent basis. It's only used for making new connections. It's also important to remember that this isn't used for the rack interconnect. And similarly, you don't have to use for data guard or DB links. It may be easier to take one link out of the chain for data guard and DB links and just use the easy connect format or even potentially a local TNS names file. So we mentioned performance, but getting no response from the directory server and how long it takes to time out is another thing that we may need to test on a proof of concept before deploying. And as I touched upon previously, some applications just may not support it. So there may be the need for some one-off TNS names that are files, and hence it may be important to have a mechanism, whether scripted through the LDAP search command, or whether automatically through the OID graphical user interface. Um, regardless, there may be a need to be able to generate a tnsnames.org file. Are there functional risks? Typically not in, in most cases. Um, all of them are going to support more complex entries like the one I've shown here, which is a TAF entry. And I say it's more complex for a number of different reasons. First of all, you can see I'm using aliases on the second line. There's HR, there's HR.world, HR.example.com or domain.com. And then there's the actual database name ORCL. So there, there's one, two, three, four different aliases for the same entry. Uh, I also have a line in there for load balance equals off and failover equals on. And obviously I have two hosts. It may look, look like the host names are quite similar there, but really the first one is win-59 and the second one is win-60. So I'm listing two different hosts in the address list. So that's why I would say this is a more complex entry than the typical entry. However, it's not overly complex and all three of the products that I mentioned so far really do support it. Now, 
if you have some really old clients that are still running Oracle 7 and Oracle 8, hopefully you don't in your organization, but if you do, there's going to be some extra steps required for them, or maybe you need to do a one-off TNS names to Aura file. Or the best solution is get rid of those old Oracle and Oracle 8.0 clients completely. If you do have a problem, the number one thing to do is to try doing an Oracle net, or previously called and still, I guess, generally called a SQL net trace. Okay? And here I'm linking some uh, my Oracle support documents that give instructions on how to do that and how to interpret the results. Another utility mentioned at the bottom there is the Oracle Trace Assistant. Again, this is there on every Oracle installation, yet most DBAs don't know about it. And that's a good utility which can parse and, and interpret an Oracle SQL Net Trace file, similar to um, what TKProf might do on a SQL Trace file. And finally, the Trace Route, the Oracle Trace Route utility is another utility that most DBAs don't know about. That provides a little bit more information when trying to debug how entries are resolved and how uh, connections are routed to the server. And if none of those Oracle provided tools work for you, well, then you can revert back to operating system based tracing. Uh, at the very beginning, there was an example using the strace command in a Linux environment showing which uh, files were touched when looking for an entry in TNS names of Aura and other .aura files. And that's a good utility for seeing exactly what Oracle is doing, what files it's touching, what it's looking for, and so forth. And if you're not running Linux, you're running a Windows client, then it's a little bit more difficult, but there are some options such as the process monitor utility from SysInternals, which is now owned by Microsoft, as well as NTTrace. So when you combine all of that, there's lots of utilities. There's very easy and quick workarounds and backouts should a uh, problem be encountered. There's some necessary proof of concept testing that would be done. And hence, really, there are risks, but I believe that they're all mitigatable. Some other last things to watch out for. Well, let's not forget the names directory path that's in our sqlnet.ora file. If we don't include LDAP in there as a source, well, it's not going to be searched. It's not going to be included. The methods are specific and are searched for in a specific order. Um, also, there's those surprising locations where you might find a TNS names to raw file. So if your directory path is saying we're going to support LDAP as well as T, uh, TNS names to as well as Easy Direct, it might find an entry first in one of those locations. If you really want to, you know, mess up your DBA for a day and, and really give them a hard time, put a bogus entry in that hidden .tns names to raw file and see how long it takes them to work out why it's not. Um, not resolving properly, though. We shouldn't be mean, so we shouldn't be doing that. And uh, finally, remember, Windows is a different operating system, and it's going to operate differently than, than Linux or POSIX-based operating systems, including different search orders, the current working directory versus home directory prioritization, and even directory different directory search orders if you have the Oracle home environments variable set or not, which is not necessarily mandatory in Windows environments. All right, so that all being said, a couple quick virtual demos just to show how easy it is to get started with some of these products. Um, OID is obviously very uh, much more complicated and cumbersome, so the virtual demo um, starts here with OpenLDAP instead. So if we want to install OpenLDAP, it's really quite straightforward. There's a couple um, RPMs that we need to install. In this case here, I'm using YUM on an Oracle Linux environment, simple enough download two packages and install them. There's a little bit of basic setup in the configuration file and they're setting a, a new administrative password which, um, for which they provide a utility which, which allows you to encrypt it into a hash which is then used later in some of the configuration text files so that you're not putting plain passwords in plain text in, in text files where they could uh, obviously be discovered and used for malicious purposes. Um, we need to create a, a default configuration file and then this is the really interesting part. We need to add Oracle as a schema to our LDAP directory store. It's not there by default. So consider this like uh, as if you have an Oracle database and you're having a new application installed. Well, your application vendor 
or maybe if it's internally, your data modelers are going to provide you a SQL script that's going to create all the necessary tables and indexes and so forth for that application. Well, conceptually, we need to do something similar in OpenLDAP. So where do we get this schema definition? So here what you can see is a couple of very simple grep and set commands where I'm grepping those uh, schema definitions right out of our Oracle Home. Now they're in our Oracle Home for the purpose for OID, but again, since the two products are forming are compatible, they're conforming to the same LDAP compliant structure and the schema is going to be the same, we can use the schema files that are in our Oracle Home designed for OID and we can implement them against OpenLDAP. So very easy to do a couple grep and set commands there to build some schema definition files. Lastly, I need to again open another parameter or configuration file and point to these new schemas and some basic setup like replacing my domain with your actual corporate domain and adding the administrator password. Using preferably the hash value that was created earlier for extra security, though if you're just doing testing and proof of concept, you could use a plain text password as well for simplicity. Now I just start the service and register it so that it starts automatically on machine boot and I'm up and running. So the last few steps are really, let's add some entries. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is manually add the organizational unit to the root of the LDAP tree. Again, this may seem kind of complex for um, DBAs, but it's, it's really not. This is a one-time thing, and here on the screen I'm showing exactly what commands and syntax you would actually have to do. Here, uh, you know, manager is the equivalent of the uh, sys user. What sys user would be in an Oracle database, manager is in the um, uh, Open LDAP directory server. Uh, obviously, you can see welcome15 is my actual password there, and I'm just adding an organizational unit that's going to be used to store all of my Oracle entries underneath it. So lastly, I add an Oracle context in there, and I'm adding my first entry. So you can see in there, actually, in the Oracle Net description, there's uh, the stuff that we're familiar with. Right? And we're using the LDAP command uh, to do that. Now, in the future, the beauty is, is that we can write a very simple shell script or, or even an Apex web interface that you know, asks us for things like the host name, the port, and the service name, and automates this and runs the LDAP add command behind the scenes. It makes it very easy to use with, um, from a DBA operational perspective and allows you to add some automation to the process. The very last thing we need to do is we need to adjust our SQLnet.ora file to tell it that we're now using LDAP and to create an LDAP.ora file to tell it where the LDAP directory server is. So you can see the first line there, uh, my SQLnet.ora file, I've added LDAP to the list of directory paths along with TNS names and Easy Connect. I haven't removed those. Um, that second line is commented out, LDAP authenticated buying, that uh, usually is not required for open LDAP, but might be for internet, sorry, active directory. And then we need to create an LDAP Aurora file. And in here you see I, bay, I provide some basic information, such as the, the context of how it's to search the LDAP tree. And most importantly, where is my LDAP server or servers? So here you can see a host name on the Pythian domain and a port of 389, which is one of the common and well-known um, LDAP ports. There's actually two common and well-known LDAP ports. One is for encrypted connections and one is for unencrypted non-SSL connections. And finally, let's test it. So I'm doing a TNS ping here for of PSoft, which is for my PeopleSoft database. You can see in the output below, it used the LDAP adapter to resolve this alias, and there, the, from that point onwards, it should look familiar to the DBAs attempting to connect, or sorry, attempting to contact, and it's giving the description string that we're familiar with, and finally a successful result with the OK and the 10 millisecond response time. So that's it, we're up and running. Um, it's really that simple, and again, I would add some automation to the addition of 
uh, future entries, and that's very easy to do through a simple script um, or other mechanism. However, if you want to really take it to the next level and really make this thing robust and and uh, reliable, there's a couple other options we can do, like we can add master and slave replication, or HA. We can secure the traffic with TLS and a certificate and, and go through a, a secure port when communicating, and we can manage it with Apache Directory Studio and the automation commands that I mentioned already, scripting additions using LDAP, add, and generating a TNS name store file using LDAP search. Easy as that. Um, Active Directory is almost just as simple. Um, Oracle already provides a great screenshot full document through this My Oracle Support Document IT of how to configure Active Directory for net naming. Uh, I didn't repeat any of the screenshots here because I figured anybody who's interested can just uh, reference that document and download the PDF from Oracle themselves. It's really a great PDF. It makes things makes it very easy to implement. So we go through the steps that Oracle provides. Uh, they're fairly straightforward. As mentioned earlier, it will require you to log on to your domain controller with administrative access, and that's probably the single biggest challenge organizationally. And when we're done, we're just going to adjust our sqlnet.ora and ldap.ora files accordingly. So just like with the Unix um, example, or sorry, the Linux example, these look remarkably similar. Um, the main difference is that we have that LDAP authenticate bind variable set to true in our sqlnet.ora, and of course, we mentioned AD as the directory server type. Actually, I forgot to mention earlier, if I just go back a few slides, when setting up open LDAP, you can see there the directory server type is actually OID. It's not open LDAP or anything else or generic LDAP, it's OID. So from an Oracle net perspective, it actually thinks it's talking to OID. The two different values we can put into that field are OID or AD. So obviously it's going to be AD for Active Directory, OID for everything else. Anyway, there we see directory server type is AD. Now we can use the Oracle Net Manager GUI um, to add entries if we like. As you can see here, I'm making a similar PeopleSoft entry. And we can use some tools like uh, here I'm using Active Directory uh, users and computers to explore my Active Directory tree. Normally a DBA would not do this. Uh, a Windows System Administrator would do this. But working with a Windows System Administrator and, or Domain Admin, possibly a DBA would do it the initial time just to make sure things are getting set up correctly. But here you can see we have our Oracle context that was automatically created when we followed the steps in the Oracle provided document. And we can see our PSOFT entry and some of the familiar fields underneath. Another tool that we can use, another sysinternals tool is Active Directory Explorer. Personally, I find that this one gives uh, more information, makes it a little bit easier to browse after Active Directory. That's probably why they created this tool in the first place. Um, and hence, it's really the one I would recommend for browsing your Active Directory to make sure the entry is in there correctly and to your liking. Okay, moving along. Last thing we want to do is test that we can extract the data. Again, this might seem kind of surprising, but we're using LDAP search, uh, a common LDAP utility, nothing to do with Active Directory uh, and not a Microsoft provided utility, utility to extract my entry. So similarly, um, similar to what I did on Linux, I'm using LDAP search. And as you can see, the stuff in yellow is coming out, which is the things that we would expect to see in our TNS names at Aura file. So from that point, again, it's just a matter of string and output manipulation to actually automatically build a TNS names at Aura file. And the last thing we want to do, is course, of course, is test it. So again, I can TNS ping. We can see that it used the LDAP adapter to resolve the alias. And we can actually make a connection and make sure we connect it to the database. Let's take it one step forward, for, further rather, and I test resolution from Linux. Okay, so again, this is uh, running from the Linux host. You can see that um, in the LDAP.ora file, I've specified the directory server, which is uh, my uh, Active Directory domain controller, and I specified directory server type equals AD, and sure enough, 
there I can do a TNS ping and I can still resolve the alias. All right, so to wrap things up, I think that uh, it's important for DBAs to understand the concept that OID, Active Directory, and OpenLDAP are really just three different versions of the same thing. And there's even other versions out there as well, as was mentioned already. Okay, People generally don't think of OID and Active Directory as being similar at all, but really internally at the guts, they fundamentally are. And hence, connect descriptors can really be stored in any of the above, right? So that's a, a good concept and something that's designed to stimulate your thought and think about, well, which is really the best place to store this data and which is the best repository for my organization where I can store this data in a structured manner where it's gonna be protected, protected from errors, protected from server failures for high availability and so forth. And personally, I believe that Active Directory and OpenLDAP are the easiest to set up. Due to the political issues of touching a, direct, a domain controller, typically Active Directory is not used, and hence OpenLDAP, I think, is uh, a very viable and realistic solution, even though it doesn't have full support in the Oracle stack. Regardless of what we choose, data can be bulk loaded, fairly easy to do. Similarly, going the other direction, data can be bulk extracted into a TNS names or a file format, and we can use simple um, scripts to automate both of those. And lastly, let's not forget that all of the utilities that I'm mentioning for automation, you already have. When it comes to uh, making a decision of whether we want to do something like this, I think the cost is mostly upfront. It's upfront in developing a solution, doing the proof of concept, making sure performance and high availability meets your standards, and documenting new operational procedures. But once all of that upfront work is done, it, it's really a breeze from that point forward. Adding additions, additional entries, generating TNS name store files if needed, or even just for backup purposes should become trivially simple and very fast due to scripting and automation. And finally, the purpose of all of this is to lower the risk in our enterprise, lower the risk of accidental corruption causing an outage, accidental deletion of a file causing an outage, propagation delays, widespread spread error, or even high availability has been, as has been mentioned many times, what happens if a server housing a common critical piece of uh, information or infrastructure such as a TNS names to raw file is corrupted or lost or just overloaded and unavailable. Okay, so the idea behind all of this was to get people thinking, to understand a couple key concepts like there are alternatives that all three of the major platforms described in this presentation are really just different versions of the same thing. And by deploying one of these solutions, we actually reduce risk in our organization for our Oracle infrastructure and the applications that depend on that. So that's my presentation for today. I'm always happy to take questions or comments uh, via email. My email address is shown there. I'm also a regular blogger on the Pythian blog site. You can find lots of great technical articles there on a variety of different technical topics and database related. You can also find a listing of my blog articles there. And you can also follow Pythian on Twitter and LinkedIn where we constantly have great updates on exciting presentations, where we're going to be, and new blog articles and so forth. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. I hope everybody enjoyed and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us today and watching Pythian's Expert Insights. Remember to connect with Simon using the information provided here at pin at pythian.com. And if you want to discover more about our expertise in Oracle, visit the URL included here or email us at info at pythian.com. Thanks for watching.